recorded. It's going to be on YouTube. All you have to do is go to YouTube and type Center for Pluralism and you get this. And I will upload this within an hour after this program. And um, if it is Sunday, it is pluralism. Pluralism is respecting the otherness of the other and accepting the God-given uniqueness to each one of us. And there is pluralism in politics, religion, culture, society, and workplace, and uh, gender pluralism. This pluralism, this program is about gender pluralism. Now I introduce my dear friend, Mary Ann Thompson Frank. She's a renowned speaker, publisher, author, philanthropist, and award-winning international sculptor. She's co-founder and president of Dallas-based nonprofit Memnozine Institute is a, on a life mission to help communities worldwide to navigate globalization's pros and cons. She believes we are more interconnected and interdependent than ever before. So we have to be thinking systematically our own survive. She is pluralist in every respect. She has embraced so many communities and a whole of humanity without a question. She has done some fantastic work with the Native Americans communities from Hopi to the Mayans. In fact, she has bridged the gap the conflict between Hopi and other traditions among the Native Americans. I have been a part of and a witness to much of her work with the Native Americans. And she has also embraced the LGBT communities thoroughly and she has done many programs on that. I must add, whatever Marianne does, she does it wholeheartedly. She puts her heart, soul and mind into it. And I also want to add a personal thing my kidneys have failed, I'm on dialysis. Marianne was the first person to offer her kidneys. Unfortunately, it did not match. And I'm always ever grateful to you, Marianne. Now the floor is yours. Thank you, Mike. Um, it is such an honor to get to be here with such esteemed uh, women. And Mike, thank you for being a man that wants to advocate for women. I think at the heart of what we're looking at, and first of all, I want to acknowledge what so many of you have been um, talking about, which I think comes back to empathy. And one of the things I like to explain to people is the importance of empathy in uniting the world today. We think of empathy as agreement. It's not agreement. I do not have to agree with you, whoever you are, 100% with everything, to be able to take my mind outside of myself and try and see from your eyes. In fact, I truly believe that the only way that we can help our world to progress in a world where globalization is due to new reality, and when I say that, I mean we are more interconnected economically, ecologically, sociologically than we have ever been before. To think that we can go back from this and to become less interconnected when every single um, influence in our lives, and I'm speaking our as in our species, and our lives is growing at a faster and faster rate, which is be naive. So the most important thing that any one of us can do right now is to step outside ourselves and cultivate the opportunity to say, why does that person, whoever that person is that is not me, see and perceive things that way? The second thing is to have humility, the humility that allows us enough um, to be able to, you know, enough of ourselves to yield, to go, okay, just because this is very real to me and I'm experiencing this and this is my reality, does not mean that, that other person's perception is any less real to them. Now, I'm not arguing about facts. I know that a lot of us have been very frustrated within recent sociopolitical times and saying, you know, in the past, we used to say, okay, this is a rock. I might say it's granite, you might say it's quartz and we'd argue over what that rock is, um, but we agreed it was a rock. Now days, a lot of times you, I might say this is a rock and someone else says it's the sky and you go, oh, I don't even know where to begin on debating that. But so I understand we're in a very strange, strange time and we have to be sensitive to that. At the same time, I think that we can still get information from the other when we go, why are they perceiving whatever this is in such a way that I think that they're basically crazy or out of their minds? Or I can't even relate. Well, 
instead of trying to argue over the subject, to step back and go, what is it revealing about themselves? Because whatever they speak passionately that they are perceiving is revealing to me what they are feeling and perceiving in their reality. And because we share a nation and because we share a globe, it is our individual responsibility to go, let me try and comprehend that. So what I'm talking about when I say empathy is gathering information. You are only going to be more empowered if you gather information. If I want to, like I was at this place in uh, Austria a number of years ago called Ars Electronica. It's a fascinating place that looks at emerging technologies that have not been uh, created in masks around the world. And they had a map of the city of Linz. And if somebody wanted to put a coffee shop somewhere, they could go in there and say, show me all the data on the most productive coffee shops in the entire city. And they could see, oh, okay, it has this kind of demographic. It has, it's located on this type of street. This, so you find all the top 10% are have these things in common. Okay, now show me on this map where all of the, those items exist but does not have a coffee shop. Okay, that's where I should locate it. So if we talk about this to each other business-wise, we'd all do that in an instant before we spend one penny. And yet we invest something more precious than money every day without cultivating a wealth of knowledge for ourselves. We go ahead and we invest ourselves emotionally. We invest ourselves spiritually. We invest ourselves sociologically and assumptions about each other all the time. And the sad thing about that is that only weakens ourselves as humanity. So we have to step back and go, well, what do I need in my toolbox to help me navigate this world and improve this world? And it begins with empathy. Now, when we understand that, when we come back to our own country, the great experiment that is America, and I like saying experiment because Thomas Jefferson, if you've ever been to the Jefferson Memorial in Washington, D.C., it's wonderful. <laughs> and there's something on it where he's, it says, it is our greatest hope, essentially, that our um, our descendants will look at us as if we were antiquated. And when you think, why would he say that? He was well because he was a visionary enough to go. Here he was standing for human rights, but he had slaves. He knew and saw with open eyes the irony and the dichotomy of the times, and that tells us that what America right now is we are an experiment that is allowing each of us to participate. Now, our country will only work if we participate 100% consciously. I'm not talking about some new age consciousness, although that's beautiful, I'm not um, reading that. I'm talking about going through life consciously aware of how we are cultivating and creating our culture. Because we each have our silos. We might be a Muslim woman, we might be an African-American woman, we might be a Native American woman. Even within Native American people, there's a diversity of cultures. Even within African-American, people want to lump everybody together. You have Muslim, you have Yoruba, you have you know Igbo, you have a million different things. You have individual cultures. Even if someone's Ethiopian American, they might be from three different tribes. I mean, we make assumptions all the time. You see a Hispanic, or, oh, they're from Mexico. Well, maybe they are, but they also might be Maya. They might be Zapoteca. You know, these are things that we don't take the time to learn about our neighbor. So when we start looking at the great diversity, this grand experiment, we can't be expected to learn everything about everybody, but we can expect ourselves to go, I don't know everything about everybody. That humility coupled with empathy allows us to move forward and participate in this great experiment with responsibility. And that brings us back to what is another great influence in the United States? Our constitution was created in large part because it was inspired by the Iroquois nation. Originally, the Iroquois nation had three different houses of government, which we were inspired by. But what, we, what they did differently is they had one house, which was the, was the judges. They had the chief and his fellow chieftains, which is what our president. But their other house was women. They literally had an entire house of women. And the reason they did that is they said, a woman can perceive things differently than men, not better, but differently. They understood the value of that diversity of perspective. Now today, I, um, as a humanitarian, I got to meet with the Dallas Foundation. They work with all the different nonprofits in the local area. And this was actually a discussion I had five years ago. And they told me, you know what's gonna happen. All these huge families with great wealth are coming together and the people that are inheriting the money happen to be women. And that what's changing is instead of huge buildings, people are caring about healthcare, they're caring about children, they're caring about elders, they're caring about the welfare of humanity. And that, that trend is gonna be increasing across the nation. So whether we like it or not, there's a huge change of money 
is moving into that. If you look at one of the rising demographics in our country that is among the most educated is African-American women. African-American women are graduating master's and doctoral degrees more than any other demographic in the country. So this is telling us a whole lot that is changing. I'm not advocating anything right now, I'm telling facts. Right now, one of the demographics that's dwindling in terms of those perceiving higher education, ironically, is men. So you see this very strange change. So whether we like it or not, women are going to continue being in positions of power and we have to get along. What that brings us back to is things such as the Violence Against Women Act. A lot of people don't realize that the Violence Against Women Act, unlike other things, isn't passed and it's set. It gets passed again and again and again regularly, and it's changed. The reason why it didn't get passed most recently under the current administration was because the Republicans, and I know this is getting political, but again, just facts, um, they didn't want to pass the Violence Against Women Act if it covered lesbian women, if it covered Native American women, if it covered uh, trans women. They had a whole list of what type of women they did not want it to cover. So instead of thinking, this is saying, Violence against anyone with a uterus is wrong. <laughs> Instead, they're like, well, this type of woman, that type of woman. When we allow that differentiation, what we as women have to do is go, you know what? I don't have to be a lesbian to care that someone should not rape a lesbian. I might not even like her entire, you know, her entire way of life. I happen to be a bi woman, so I have no problem with that. But I might be in a position where I say, I don't appreciate a, a lesbian person. I'm a Southern Baptist. This is the, not, but you know what? I also don't appreciate a woman being raped. So I don't like that. Um, I don't have to be a Native American woman to say man camps that are set up wherever they end up creating, uh, you know, oil pipelines and gas pipelines um, and saying, you know, when they set up these man camps and they don't have any oversight, there's a huge uptick and murdered and missing indigenous women. We're talking over 5,000 some that are missing. It's a going trend. At the same time, I met with a friend of mine who's CEO of a company that puts trains in. They have camps, but they don't have those, those statistics. I asked her what's the difference. She said, as CEO, I drive there regularly. I do random checks. I hire police officers to go by regularly at random checks. I encourage families to live there as a consequence. No, why? Because she's a woman. So this just tells you the difference in how living consciously and with empathy and going, let me be a responsible citizen and understand that I need to take responsibility for the other, even if the other is not me. So these are things that I'm just giving out as examples. You know, right now in North Carolina today, if a woman is beginning to be engaged in, in, in a sexual act, we're just talking kissing, maybe making out a little bit, it is now illegal for her not to follow the act all the way through. She can literally be sued by the man by not following the act all the way through. Wow. Right now in the camps on the border today, we have young women um, who are, you know, who are menstruating and they're given one tampon. And if they bleed on themselves, they're put in solitary for the crime of bleeding on themselves. We are literally denying young women access to menstrual products. You know, these are things that we are currently engaged in as a country. So we have come an incredibly long way. No one can deny that. You know, I think about my mom, who is an airline stewardess, and I brought her in because I was speaking at an event with these high-level execs of um, hosted by women that soar, and they were all these people, executive VPs in the company. And we walk in the building, and she just stood for a moment. She said, you know, Last time I was in here, I had my waist and my bust measured because of stewardess, you had to have a ratio, you know, 24 or 36 to be allowed to keep your job. And she's like, It's surreal to be here. And it was even more surreal to her to see this high level corporate exec, you know, in the company that used to measure her. And as I told her and my friend Yvonne Poom, who had the similar job, I said, You know, what you all did, you fought so that someone like me can travel around the world internationally and make my own money. And yes, you have to subject yourself to being demeaned, to being measured, but at the same time, you were willing to put up with that so you could open and kick down doors. You know, and this is something that all of us living today also have to really pause and say, thank you. So to all the women out there that are 50 and older, I wanna say thank you because every single one of us is standing on their shoulders. And I realize if you take it even further, my grandmother, you know, they, they didn't get the right to vote into 1920. You know, this has been a hundred years that we have fought to come to where we are today. And I think about what she fought. She lived in Texas before a woman could get married she, and keep all the wealth she came into it with if there was divorce. 
Uh, used to be a woman could come with millions. They divorced. The man would have millions. She wouldn't have a penny to her name. These are the realities that women have fought so hard for us to get where we are today. And when I look at that, I say, well, what kind of ancestor am I being? How am I being a responsible person? Will I add to this great legacy of women who have done so much over time? Will I add and advocate for the lesbian woman? for the trans woman, for the Native American woman, for the black woman, for the Muslim woman, for the Hispanic woman, for the Asian woman. Will I advocate for them? Will my place in history be one that is adding to the grand experiment that is America? Or will I just be another blip that went by and didn't do anything to change this world? I don't know about you, but during this time, we are more empowered than any other generation before us. And your phones or anyone that's watching this, you have access to the ability to get an extra people and to get data and to have your voice heard faster immediately in a way that kings and queens couldn't do just a hundred years ago. So exactly. right now, more than ever before, we have this responsibility to recognize our actions literally are changing this world. So what do you want to do about it? Thank you, Marianne. I had asked the same question to the other panelists. I'll ask you the same question. You may want to respond briefly. How does equality of men and women and all members of the society benefit the society and also it adds to the economic power? Uh, let me also mention a few things before you answer that. Uh, Marianne Thompson is the daughter of the founder of 7-Eleven stores long time ago, which they sold. And uh, Dr. Naila Ali Khan's grandfather is Sheikh Abdullah. He is uh, the chief minister of the state of Kashmir for a long time, for probably 30 yes. years. He was the first Muslim prime minister. <laughs> yes. And uh, Shalini Gupta's brother is a Supreme Court. I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, Naila. Uh, so was the first Muslim prime minister of Kashmir. Correct. And Thank then a political prisoner for 22 years. Returned to Kashmir in 75 and won a landslide victory in what is still considered the fairest and the freest election in South Asia. Thank and you. And became head of government again. He's one of the most respected people in the state of Kashmir and all through India. And uh, Shalini Gupta's brother is a major activist in India. He's also the uh, former Supreme Court judge. Uh, you want to say a few words about your brother? Uh, I'll just say that I come from a family of freedom fighters who fought for India's independence. Both my grandparents were active in that. Uh, my father was a uh, the law minister in uh, one of the uh, regimes, and uh, my brother is a public interest lawyer who fights for the underprivileged and uh, uh, fights for uh, for justice, social justice. I and I salute him. I salute him for the work he's doing. Name? What was your father's name, Ms. Gupta? Uh, Shanti Bhushan, mm -hmm. and my brother is Prashant Bhushan. Oh, I see. Okay. Uh, Dr. Ida Jones, I just met you, and I know uh, Dr. Naila Khan, Shalini, and uh, Mary Marianne for a long time, so I was able to tell about their background. Would you mind sharing a little bit about your background? Surely. I don't have the pedigree of, as my panelists do. I'm just a, a person who was born in Cambridge, Massachusetts to uh, West Indian ancestry from Barbados and Jamaica. One G on my father's side and second G on my mother's side and uh, have been living. I was born here, of course, in America, educated in, at Howard University and just really concerned myself with the, the African diaspora in terms of representation and unity and understanding of the collective oppression of colonization and imperialism from European and other entities. So Mary, I'm back to you. Can you go and uh, give a short summary of how does equality benefit the society in general and the eco economy of the nation? Yes, um, I wanna mention, I mean, people are always quick to talk about what my family did economically, but if I was to ask my, um, my father, my grandfather, my grandfather actually began 7-Eleven, my dad was the one that took it um, international um, and national. 
but you know, both of them would tell you that what they were proudest of is they fought the Ku Klux Klan, they fought for integration from the 20s all the way up until it happened at great risk themselves. They regularly had, unfortunately, or fortunately, um, anywhere from 40 to 60 cone hat people with uh, you know, flaming crosses in their backyard threatening their lives because they, they believed in what they did. And he would consider that an even greater legacy than his corporate legacy. Uh, but one of the reasons why they did that was because they believed, and it began, and this is very relevant to your question. My grandfather was in charge of what was at the time called Negro Day at the State Fair of Texas. And that was because during the 1920s, it was all segregated and they had one day out of the year that African Americans were allowed to go to the fair. And as he worked on oversaw making that day happen, he ended up working with a lot of African Americans that were doing exceptional work. And so that would only end up being for the fair. So he would say, well, you're a good worker, why don't you come work with me? And they would work at 7-Eleven back when it was Oak Farms. And over time, he would promote whoever did a good job. And eventually, my dad, being the oldest, was apprenticed. And my grandfather wanted him to work underneath whoever ended up being the best at different jobs. And often, they were black or brown or yellow or, you know, Native American. And my, um, my father just didn't think about it. He just went whoever and learned from whoever did the best. And that really upset the Ku Klux Klan enough to threaten my family's lives for decades. Um, and my grandfather was mystified. He truly was just thinking in terms of business. And he said, it just makes good business sense to hire the best and not worry about, you know, because I want my company to do well. And that pulled him into the fight. And I share that story because I think that it's very relatable to what you were talking about, Mike, which is why, do, why does this relate economically? We do better economically as a community when we are looking at the best and cultivating the best. You know, pedigrees are only important when they actually talk about morality and values and ethics and what it's actually creating in the world. So I think if it's much, you know, I, I myself am an adopted from Mexico. So, you know, I can't claim a DNA pedigree. What my legacy is, is learning from the morals and ethics of all those different generations and what they fought for and what they risked their lives for. If I can't live up to that, that I'm not living up to the legacy in my family. I could make all the money in the world and I'm not living up to the legacy of my family. A deeply intimate way that I'll share with everyone here is the minute you say to the universe, to God, this is what I stand for. Be prepared to be tested. There are many times where I could have made a lot of money by tossing my values aside, but I wouldn't like who looked at myself in the mirror when I brushed my teeth. And that's, at the end of the day, it's just you and your accountability is up there brushing your teeth. Who are you seeing? So I would encourage all of you, think of economics as a tool. It's like a hammer. I can kill someone with it. I can build something with it. It by itself is not evil, but are we investing in communities? Are we doing what we need to do economically to lift other people up? Because right now it's jury rigged for the very uh, the top 1%. If so-and-so went to, you know, shared some kind of fraternity brother and they wouldn't play golf for years when some big deal's coming up, guess who's going to be aware of that deal? And you got to have 50,000 to get in the minimum. So, you know, it's the irony is everything is jury rigged for the wealthy. So how do we start implementing changes that allow money to move and lift and invest in lives. And that's where we have to move, the social responsible investing and in conscious capitalism becoming equally used. Because when we look at all the money in the world that is available, like this is the, what we need for the world to address all of our issues. This is what's in, um, you know, in countries' hands and in nonprofits' hands. The way majority of it is all in private hands. So if we really want to make a change, we have to take the marching in the streets to Wall Street and we have to be able to put our actions where our mouth is. So that's how we make that change. Thank you. Okay. Mike, now, could I uh, ask a couple of quick points because I have to leave. Okay. So just a couple of quick points. Marianne, um, I, I would like to say that I gave a talk on a book entitled The Indian Givers a month ago at Guthrie Public Library. And the book was an eye opener for my audience because it's all about how Native Americans have influenced the world in a variety of ways, uh, in terms of food, medicine, government, politics, the role that women played, the Iroquois nation in politics. And that was an eye opener for my predominantly white middle-class Oklahoman audience. So we have a lot to learn. 
from Native Americans, number one. The second point that I would like to make real quick is that while it is important to condemn human rights violations, while it is important to question militarization, colonialism, imperialism, it is also important to question the infantilization of women within our own communities that has been glorified for the longest time. So I think it is important to question the objectification of women within our own communities as well. And again, Mike, for which some people employ religious discourse yes. to justify that objectification or infantilization. So I think that is necessary. And the third point, and probably the most important one, is that as privileged, educated women and as women who have a platform and a voice, do we tend to place ourselves on a pedestal and portray ourselves as saviors of those women who are not as privileged? And how much of a problem is that, right? For instance, point. when some feminists write about women in Afghanistan, do they reduce those women in Afghanistan to the veil? Is their reading of the plight of those women highly reductive? And do those privileged feminists portray themselves as the saviors of those women instead of looking at how we can build coalitions with those at the grassroots levels who know their local communities much better than the rest of us do, who are privy to networks that can be formed within those communities to redress problems and redress issues. So coalition building, as opposed to portraying ourselves as saviors because we are placed in the developed world, the first world, because we enjoy a voice, we enjoy a platform. You see, it's all very well to talk about how much we have access to today, but there are several parts of the world where women even today lack access to education, in which women who seek that access are demonized by their own communities. They lack access to basic health care, right? but we cannot reduce them to objects. So it's important to work with those at the grassroots level. And that will go a long way toward peace building, conflict resolution, uh, human rights, et cetera. So that's if I could what I respond want. to, especially that last point, you know, when I was in Rwanda, it was very interesting to us because we were one, we took one morning to go and see the gorillas. And as we were leaving, we saw women carrying these you know, the stick with a buck, you know, buckets on either side going up and the guy said, oh, they're going for water. Okay. We see the gorillas, we come back and they're coming down, obviously much heavier. And he said, have they been doing that all day? He said, no, no, no. That was one trip. They, they went to get water. And we had with us some people that come in and they were ready to put lots of money into investing in small businesses. And they have doing this, doing this, doing this, doing this. And, you know, the irony of what I saw was that, yes, unless you sat down and sat with the people and had the humility to say, whoever lives somewhere, they're the experts. The most intelligent, pe strongest people I've ever met have often been people dealing in third world situations. And I say situations and not nations because we have third world situations within our first world nation. Yeah. We need to understand that too. Um, so when we look at those areas, you have some of the most resilient and intelligent people because they have to be. They will tell you what they need. People come in and say, we have this idea, this formula, this formula. And yet, most likely all those formulas have been tried and there's a reason they haven't worked. So there's having the humility to sit down and say, let's co-create. I have resources, you have resources. Your resources may not be economical, but they are from experience. They're from your wisdom. They're from all the things that your generations have known. You tell me what you need and let's create this together. And not only that, but let's create it together where we end up investing in you to become the leader where you are and lifting you up. Um, as a privileged woman, 
the thing that often that results in that is I need to invest in the PR shining a light on these individuals and their communities. I need to use my ability to have a platform to open a stage to give somebody else a platform. And so that's a very tricky thing where you cultivate allowing yourself to be out there to have that power, but at the same time, trying to find a way to use it to open doors and lift other people up because every one of us have to prove ourselves. So yeah. going back as a privileged woman, I would say, yes, I'm privileged, but I had to work very hard to have myself taken seriously. How do I maintain that and open the door and make sure that that next woman doesn't have to work as hard to get that saying her voice taken as seriously and make sure she's front and center and have the humility to learn from her. She's someone to work with, not someone to give something to. We have Correct. to get that out of our mind. Correct. Thank you, Mary Ann. Uh, let, me, let me make a quick announcement. Let me make a quick announcement. It's two o'clock. Our official time is over, but I request uh, if whoever wants to stay for another 15 minutes, we can carry the conversation. And we may also allow, we may also want some of our guests to ask some questions. So go ahead, uh, Dr. Nala Khan. You're going to say something. Uh, Mike, I'm so sorry, but I'm going to have to leave. This was a privilege. I thought every panelist was excellent. Everyone made wonderful points, and I enjoyed this discussion. It was very rich, diverse, pluralistic. That was the best part of it. Indeed. Very pluralistic. Indeed. No one community, no one racial or ethnic group was privileged. I appreciate that. Thank you yes. so much. And Thank you. you have a good afternoon. You and as we well. will carry the conversation for some more time. All, right. All the very best. And uh, Mike, I, uh, I didn't ahead. need to leave, but thank you. This was an absolutely wonderful session and uh, really enjoyed listening to all the panelists. Um, wealth of knowledge here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Ida Jones? Uh, yes, oh, I can okay. stay for another 10 or 15 minutes just okay. to finish. Marianne's been very engaging. <laughs> <laughs> as well as my co-panelists, I really enjoyed it. Thank you so much for having me. I don't want to slight anybody, but it's been an honor and an opportunity to broaden my horizon. So thank you. Well, I appreciate that. Uh, if any one of our guests have a question, please feel free to ask. Who will Andra, you have a question, comment? Yeah, um, can you hear me? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Andra is my dear sister. She has been <laughs> very caring about uh, my health and constantly inquiring and uh, keeping me in, uh, in touch with her. Go ahead, Andra. <clears throat> we all care about you, Mike. You're really an incredible soul doing incredible things. And uh, it's, it's almost like every subject in the world you, you're covering in one way or another and uh, pushing the envelope all the time. So I greatly respect that. I want to keep you alive for a long time. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so um, uh, so uh, listening to everybody, the, the information that each one of you shared, and I'm not going to call names, each of you panelists uh, uh, offered su such very rich information, very, very helpful. Uh, as an activist myself, I really wonder, because so many people are working on the uh, concept of um, systemic racism now, uh, and of course we're talking about women's rights and, and equality for women. Uh, as an activist, what is it that you would advise somebody like me who works with other groups to be able to share? What type of strategies? We hear the pain, we hear the history, uh, we know what we're in the midst of that is continuing, maybe not as ex maybe not as openly as it was as it was at one time, but nonetheless, it still exists. Uh, what can we do about it to be able to cause um, some type of a change? Um, and what is it? Let's say, um, uh, uh, Dr. Jones in particular, what is it that you've seen throughout history that has actually caused the changes of the progress that we have seen? Dr. Jones? Yes, I think collective pain and uh, Dr. Barber, Reverend Barber in North Carolina, who's the president of the NAACP with his Moral Mondays has made that very clear that irrespective of one's race, gender, religion, what have you, poverty is now a unifying theme in America and that the poverty class is far more 
uh, desperate in terms of their need than they are in terms of any other kinds of uh, divisive points that we talk about. So what he is seeing and what he has sought to galvanize is that those who are truly the least of us in this quote land of wealthy are really the ones that are going to shift the paradigm because they have children, they have medical needs, they have urgent human rights that are being totally ignored in America. So I think that what we're going to see in the 21st century is a shift from this vertical relationship on the obvious color, class, religion, to the real kinds of have and have not. And that chasm is widening. Even with the current fiscal crisis we're in right now, people are being threatened with homelessness or being unhoused because they can't pay their rents. So there are some real bread and butter issues that transcend party, religion, gender, and it's just going to be a matter of human survival. And it's gotten so callous globally, <laughs> not just here in North America, that there's a global issue that has caused great problems, never mind the environmental issues that affect all of us. So I see the needle definitely ticking that way that if we don't concern ourselves in an empathetic fashion, then Thank we're you. all going to lose. Uh, Dr. Sangeeta Singh, uh, you had a question? Uh, no, I don't have a question. I may have a comment. First of all, this was wonderful. All these three ladies that presented were excellent. Um, Marianne Thompson, uh, Frank's parents, lived next door to my very good friend, Deep and uh, uh, honey, uh, uh, deep and honey, uh, and um, uh, when I last was there, she was probably very young. But two presenters that really made an impact on me, uh, they made some comments that are very important to note. One was Amish uh, uh, Gupta, uh, who said that there is no cohesiveness in women's uh, group. Uh, there's too much diversity. And people don't realize that. And the real, there, a lot of you talked about very lofty ideals and, and they are not possible because of this uh, diversity. And there are certain uh, basic temperamental uh, obstacles in the way of women becoming cohesive group. And one is jealousy. I have worked in academia for over 40 years. And I started out with mostly men. Uh, and for 28 years, I was the only PhD a person in my whole department. And now we have uh, seven of us, 50% women. Women are the worst enemies of women. They, <laughs> they obstruct each other. They rather, they don't have problems seeing men um, competing or men doing well but they have if another woman, especially if she's from different <laughs> ethnic background, uh, they do not tolerate that very well. Uh, I have not seen black women, white women um, accepting, I mean, there are of course um, uh, exceptions, but I have not seen them accepting each other very well. I have not seen Hispanic, I live in an area where Hispanic women are uh, in abundance and they uh, do not accept white women and white women don't accept uh, Hispanic women. There's all kinds of such stuff. And then uh, that is in the way of uh, women uh, being a really called a group. And um, so I, I, a lot of the talk that is done uh, in, uh, for women uh, really doesn't make much difference because uh, we have underlying uh, these okay, problems well. that uh, are in the way of uh, women to be recognized as truly equal partners of men. Another problem I have with this women's movement, I've been in America for since 1967, came as a teenager. And I have, I was in the world, I came to Mississippi State University. I don't know how many of you know Mississippi should be the most prejudiced, one of the most prejudiced areas. I did not feel that in academia. academia. Uh, my professors did not treat me any differently than any other. But I felt that from my uh, uh, women uh, peers, not from my superiors, uh, and also, I, uh, I've uh, experienced more of this uh, problem of inequality uh, uh, in the areas of uh, not so much uh, in how I get education or anything, in the areas of uh, 
uh, maybe um, more in the political areas. And so we have come a long way in the political area in equality, but uh, I don't want to take too much of your time. I know everybody wants to go home, uh, but I just have uh, lots of random thoughts of not agreeing with many of your present uh, uh, presenting ideas because there are problems that have not been addressed. The two ladies, uh, Marianne Thompson and uh, uh, Frank and uh, uh, Miss uh, Gupta, they they touched on them, and I wish they would focus more on those areas if they want to do any good to women's uh, cohesive uh, groupness, you know. And also, this uh, uh, one one last thing I want to say is, when you start uh, talking about me movement uh, or uh, Black Lives Matter or or uh, all this diversity thing. Diversity has become such a garbage term right now. And then what you're doing is, by doing that, you're uh, already segregating yourselves from another group. And until and unless we come together as people, regardless of race, uh, religion, color, and so on, unless we come together as people, doesn't matter what gender we are, what race we are, what background we are, and unless we, especially if we're in America, unless we call ourselves Americans and stop doing all this uh, diversity overreaction, we're not gonna be happy. And we have damaged our country more with this overreacting to the diversity than to uh, uh, try to bring ourselves together as human beings who are dealing with the same kind of struggles and coming together. And the worst part to see was the, how we have dealt with COVID-19. And it has been politicized so badly, it hurts me to see how badly we are reacting to that. But anyway, thank you, thank you so much. And I, <laughs> I, I guess my old professorship is speaking uh, yes. opinions, but that doesn't mean I, uh, I know everything. This is just my current reaction. I might change it tomorrow. Uh, and, Dr. Singita Singh is a professor of psychology in San Angelo and uh, Governor Abbott of Texas has just appointed her as on the board of advisors. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Can uh, I ask you to respond to her, Mike, please? Sure, please do. Thank you so much. Um, First of all, I, I honor and respect um, your path in life and what has led you and what you shared with us. Thank you for having the courage to do that. Um, however, one of the things I actually, I'm going to touch on each of those things in terms of women being uh, the worst enemies of women, that's not unusual. I think we see that among minorities and it comes unfortunately because you do have a history of people um, dealing with all sorts of challenges that were aimed at their demographic. And so people labor under the idea there's only room for one of me at the top one woman, one brown person, one black person. And so that, you know, feeling is like fighting, fighting, fighting. I actually wrote a, an article on this earlier this year for a magazine, Success Sisters magazine. But the point I'm making with that is that having been brought up in a, uh, a family that made it and was full of powerful men, a thing that I saw on the old boy network is they would each take the time to lift someone else up because they saw, if I lift you up, I empower my network. And that's where we have to get women thinking. And that's a challenge, but that's how we change that. Now, I want to sidestep to another topic. I hear what you're saying about diversity, and I've heard that argument before about it weakening things. However, I think that you can only build on a solid foundation. It doesn't matter how beautiful your building is if that foundation is not solid. Um, we're celebrating 100 years of women having the right to vote, when in actuality, Native American women didn't actively get the right to vote until the 1960s. So when we're looking at things, we can already see, you know, when Alice Paul was leading women to fight for the right to vote, African-American women were told they were not allowed to march because they didn't want to have two different agendas, a racial agenda and a women's agenda. Uh, you know, when you look at the Violence Against Women Act, the women that were like, we just need to get this Violence Against Women Act passed were very ready to drop off lesbians and Native Americans from the list of protected women. So when we talk about this, we have to be sensitive to the fact that different demographics have not all walked the same path to today. And if we want to unify the women 
way we're able to do that is again, having the empathy for me to look at, for example, an African-American woman and say, you walked a very different path than white women, than brown women, than Asian women. And I need to be sensitive and know that history and see what individual circumstances you're fighting on. Because just for example, we have food deserts in Dallas. We have an initiative that used to feed 2,500 families a day. It's now feeding upwards of 5,000 families, sorry, 5,000 families a day when it used to be 2,500 families a week. That's because of what's happening economically. A lot of that is affecting women and their communities. We talk about the environment. In Dallas, we have what's called Shingle Mountain, where shingles are dumped in the backyards of a lot of single women, you know. And so this is, you know, it's not an equal fight. That does not take away from the fight of someone who's privileged to work in an academic environment who's having to prove herself. I'm not surprised that somebody with um, high credentials would be more open-minded because we've seen that as education increases, most, most people end up being more open and pluralistic by default. But when people haven't had access to education, they're going to be stuck in some of the old thinking and not realizing that that's actually hindering them. So I hear everything you're saying, but I also think that diversity and being aware of the diverse paths that different demographics have taken and are still taking is a large part of what we need to be able to unify women's voices. Because I can't walk beside and march beside African-American women, whether it's in my investing or it's in my activism or it's in my humanitarian work if I don't recognize the unique fight that they've had to do because all that history from slavery to segregation kept them from getting the economic background underneath generations that other races had the privilege to stand on. So, you know, looking at Native American women, same situation. We have to recognize what do we need to do to make it more inclusive and have the humility to understand that, no, my walk and the multiple generations walk to get me here is different. And how do I respect that and help make sure their voices are heard? I hope that- Thank you, Mina. Appreciate, thank you, appreciate. Uh, Wayne has a question. Wayne, go ahead, please. Oh, uh, Wayne, all, Wayne is a newspaper editor and he publishes a newspaper. Wayne, go ahead. Yeah, first of all, I would have uh, responded to the lady who spoke to uh, the group before, Marianne Frank, I think her last name is, but she spoke for me. So I won't say anything, I'll move on. Uh, everything was great. It's great to hear messages I've heard before, but this time for more diverse experiences and with broad examples. But given all of that, how much value do you put, each of you, each of the panelists, put on including pansexuals in the next discussion? Go ahead, And, 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 and to piggyback on Mary, Mary Ann, I'm not pansexual, but at least I want to be able to uh, empathize with people who are unlike me. We have to learn to respect the otherness of other. God has created all of us and all of us. When we sense, when we feel, act, think equal, the society will have fewer conflicts and all of us can live in peace and harmony and do more prosperity and progress. And thank you, Wayne, for that question and the response. Uh, we got, we will close actually at 2.30 in another 12 minutes and we will welcome any conversation from anyone. I'd like to add to Wayne's question, or Marianne, you can go first. Well, actually, I was, waiting for, actually, I was really waiting for you all to answer. Actually, I was waiting for you all to answer. I'm just, to respond to your answer, sir, it's real easy. Whatever you're doing sexually in your life, it's none of my business. How you work at your job and how you contribute to society, that's my business. Uh, you know, are you doing a good job and are you being a good human being when you're out in society? What you're doing in the privacy of your own bedroom, that's none of my business and shouldn't be. I hope that answers your question. <laughs> well, I think to answer this question historically, the, the issue was not pansexuals being involved in 1920, although we know that they did exist. I mean, the whole idea of the, the, the pantheon of sexual options have existed since the beginning of time. They've just not been defined into different categories. But with regards to the idea of pansexuals as well, someone had put in the chat about why are men not involved in this conversation on gender, because it was very lopsided to have only women on the conversation, that once again, you can't please everybody. So you have to start the conversation somewhere. And I think this was a rather um, a great attempt to start somewhere to have diversity of religion and ethnicity and region of country in this conversation. But we have plurality is so infinitive. 
it's infinite. So as a result, we would never be able to converse because we'd be constantly adding to the new dimensions. But to answer Wayne's question directly, the idea of pansexuals being this kind of alternate group outside of the LGBT community or the transgender community, they're kind of, of are fluid and go across all of them. So I think if they choose to identify publicly about their uh, sexual options, as Marianne said, that's not a, a principal lead in the conversation as far as we're concerned, but they still should be allowed to have the rights of a citizen and a human being where they're respected to be able to earn as much, be able to live where they want and be able to celebrate themselves however they choose to in the public sphere. And I think America is so fraught right now because the dominant group, the white male Anglo-Saxon Christian Protestant is losing ground. And like any kind of animal that is losing ground or cornered, they're going to fight to maintain those ideals. And as a result, we're seeing that fight right now in the public sphere. So there is um, a lot to be said and had about this conversation, but the 21st century is only nearly 25 years old. So we definitely have a lot more time to see how it's going to unfold. Friends, you're watching to the Center for Pluralism. And this program, if it is Sunday, it is about pluralism and religion, culture, politics, and society. Every week we have a different program. And this one is about gender pluralism. And this program will be uploaded on the website. Uh, we have a channel, YouTube channel. You just go to youtube.com and plug in Center for Pluralism and you get this. And within the one, one hour, uh, as soon as this up gets uploaded, it will be uploaded on the website and is available to all of you to share. Thank My, you. Uh, go ahead. I have something to say to Andre. Yeah, Andre. Yes. Andre, uh, that is very nice of you to say that what can we do? Um, I have uh, worked, I'm a physician and I have worked for 10 years at the Department of Corrections. And I saw so much of injustice regarding the law of uh, amount of punishment that is given to crack selling and to cocaine, 10 years as to only 10 months. And I was so much affected and I wanted, I even uh, had my one of my sons become a lawyer so that when you grow, you change this law, you know? And fortunately, I don't have to wait for that. When Obama became the president, uh, Obama and his AG changed this law and reduced that uh, uh, disparity by 90%. Uh, but still not just, but still 90% of it is eliminated. But now I think the main, most important thing I feel, and it's a criminal thing that is happening. People do not observe that. And because I, am, I really care about the Afro-American population and the Caucasian population, human beings in general, everybody. But the injustice that is there in the school system, the inner city school system, does not have any trade um, training. Whereas if you come to a suburban area, like where I live in Prince William County, the middle school, high school kids are given the training in computers that when they leave high school, they don't even have to do anything else. They can make 50,000, 60,000 easily. I think this is the kind of training the inner uh, city schools middle school and high school kids should get to the girls and the boys. And then this will give them some hope that they can make money, they have a trade and the crime in the city crime will stop killing each other, killing each other, gunning down as if it's like a war going on. All that will go away if we remove this injustice, you know? So we as women should do try to find out how we can eliminate this uh, injustice, you know? It's, to me, it's like criminal, you know? It's like a water for white people and water for black people, uh, different tap waters. It still exists in a different form, you know? So yeah. this <laughs> happen in today in the 21st century, a young child, uh, Afro-American child in the inner city that are there, and they are not given this trade uh, training and education. That's that's one thing. And I think as women, the woman can do whatever she wants to do, however she wants to do, anyone. Just like a man can do whatever he wants to do, as much as he applies, a woman can do too. It's not now, it is in like 1850s when Harriet Tubman, she escaped from slavery. She helped men and women escape from slavery. She helped so many people, she was called a Moses. That is in, 18, in the 19th century. So it is all up to us how much we do. 
for the society, for our children, black and white and brown and everybody, you know, what we do, how we remove this injustice, how we remove this uh, poverty, you know. So you. this is what I would like to say, Andre. Uh, so if we can work and remove this and give these skills that they can make the younger kids. Inner city violence will go in Chicago on a weekend, there'll be 13, 14 death murders. Good That's points. Not- it's like a war ground. You don't have to go to Iraq to get killed. You're getting killed on your own in your own house. So we have to do something as as mothers, as as sisters, as daughters. That's I agree. I, I agree. Uh, by the way, Diandra, I appreciate you. Uh, uh, I live. I chose to live in an all African American neighborhood. There is not a single person who is. Uh, non-black in this area other than me. And uh, and thanks to the Andre, it is her home that I am leasing here in uh, Washington, D.C. And I am enjoying my life uh, living in an all uh, African-American community. It is a beautiful experience, nothing different than any other experience I have had. Uh, now I will back to our friends, guests. Anybody wants to make any comments? We got about five minutes left. Uh-huh. If I could respond to her, um, you know, one of the hard things about dealing with these kind of issues is that people don't want to take the eagle's eye view. And unfortunately, if you want to stop the number of young African-American men, especially, which are the number one demographic to be put in jail, um, the system is very rigged against them, which is no news for anyone. But what a lot of people don't understand is, for example, here in Texas, it's legal to make a prisoner work for free. So basically, slavery is legal among prisoners in Texas. And the most number one demographic is a young African-American kid who was caught smoking a joint. Um, Why is this legal? Well, you can go on YouTube. I invite people to do this and you can see auctions is the best way I can describe it. I actually saw a video where the young African-American man put on a box and a person, which I can only describe as an auctioneer saying, literally saying this young buck can get you this many hours of work. Um, That is, and there were corporations who were basically bidding on what prisoners they wanted to do their their work. That is very legal in the state of Texas. Um, The point that, and Obama thankfully made it illegal for federal uh, prisons. But the point that I'm making is that unless we get rid of the financial impetus to stop that, we're not going to see all the institutions that lead to the maximum potential for a young man to follow that path um, changing. So if we want that to change, we have to change the schools, we have to change the kind of sentences they receive, we have to do all these things, and we have to find other ways for the American public to be willing to pay more for their material objects because they're wanting slave created prices. I mean, that is unfortunately the the economic vehicle behind the reality that your um, your friend just addressed. Thanks, thanks to everyone. I appreciate all the panelists. Uh, to my heart, it is a good discussion, and um, also want to mention that this would be available within an hour at uh, YouTube. Go to logincenterforpluralism.com. It will be there, and I appreciate everyone. And also want to appreciate uh, always Aslam who is in Calcutta, India, and he has an organization called Indian Pluralism. And uh, he has been technically helping me in the background to make sure we have least obstructions and everybody got admitted. And I want to thank him for doing this. And uh, always you may want to leave your website uh, on the chat so people can contact you if they want to. And I want to thank every one of you and appreciate this and i think we have to carry this discussion one more time there is a lot more to go we will uh, hold this discussion soon probably within the next 20 to 25 days if it is sunday it is pluralism pluralism every sunday between 12 and 1 30 it is about cultural pluralism religious pluralism on one sunday and societal pluralism on once and political pluralism on one Sunday, four Sundays, four different aspects of pluralism. Pluralism simply is respecting the otherness of the other and accepting the God-given uniqueness of each one of us. I want to thank everyone. God bless America. God bless all of us. And may our society flourish, feel, believe, act equal with every human being. Thank you very much.
Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much for inviting me. I enjoyed this very much. And I next time I'll tell you one more thought uh, sure. that, I, uh, that I didn't get to share. Mariana really enjoyed listening to you. Thank you. And the feeling is very much mutual to all of you. And um, I would request, Mike, if you're able to, um, sorry, my phone. I would request if you're able to connect me with the other panelists, I would certainly love to explore collaborating with them and supporting their work in whatever regions they're at. Absolutely, I'll send the, the joint email with the permission of everyone to everyone so you can connect with each other. Thank you. Is that, uh, Dr. Ada Jones, is that okay to share your email? Perfectly fine, thank you so okay. much. Okay, Dr. Sangeeta Singh, can I share your email too? Absolutely, but I'm not, uh, I'm for various reasons, I'm not uh, allowed to be uh, presenting in such forums other than be a listener or just- Got uh, it, got uh, it, that is your, no problem. Because uh, certain conflicts of interest. So I, uh, but I enjoy this very much. I definitely would like to attend again, especially when um, Marianne and Ida Jones come back again. <laughs> <laughs> we will, we love to have the same panelists again. I, I, really, I, I really like the historical uh, count that Ms. Jones gave because most of uh, that, that lot of this, I didn't know. Thank you, Ms. Jones. You're welcome. Dr. Jones. It is a very enlightening conversation. Thank you so much. We got a lot of work to do and we will do, I am with you, whatever I can do as I don't want to call a man, as whatever I can do as a human, I am there to stand with all women. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, bye-bye. 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 And happy new year to everyone. Yeah. Happy, happy new year. God bless you all. Thank you always. Dilshad, that's my sister. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. He appreciate it. Thank you, sir. I'll log off right now. Okay. Uh, the Dr. Mike, um, I have I have uh, taken uh, I had logged in and this. All right, thank you, thank you, Dr. Thank All you. right, share me the Facebook. Which Facebook you had? Uh, share me the link so I can share with others. Of course. Thank you so much. Take care. Dilshad, salam alaikum. Thanks. <laughs>